Welcome everyone, thanks for, for coming. Um, lots of people here, which is great. Um, lots of old friends here and um, also some new names, which is, which is fantastic. So I'm just, I'm not gonna hear, I'm Tom Jenks, for those of you who don't know me. In fact, I'm still Tom Jenks, for those of you who do know me, actually thinking about it. Um, and I'm the editor of Zimzala, um, and I'm just gonna do, you're not gonna hear too much from me. I'm just gonna do a brief intro to the press, just to set the context for, um, for Phil and Sophie's readings tonight. Um, introduce those to um, so Phil and Sophie, and then round up a little bit. Of the <coughs> so the order is going to be: um, Phil will go first. We'll have um, Phil will read for um, a while, and then we'll have some time afterwards for um, some discussion, some Q and A. If you'd like to do that, so I'm just going to share my screen. You can all see that. We've got quite a lot on tonight, so um, I'm going to suggest that you, if you could keep yourselves on mute, um, just to sort of cut down background noise and so we don't get any interference with the readings. Um, as I say, there will be an opportunity to um, address some questions or to, I'm just going to let these people in, sorry, from the waiting room. There will be you to have some discussion, raise some questions, but I think the, probably the best thing to do, unless you really want to speak out loud, is to put those in the chat box um and uh i will pick those up and i will put those to phil and to sophie i'm sorry i'm a bit distracted here and trying to just let everybody in late comers so just tell you a little bit about zimzala so zimzala has been going since 2009 a long time um, the first thing that um, Zimzala did, I did on Zimzala, was um, actually just a PDF of Tina Dara's Opposable Dumbs. That was in 2009. Since then, things have got a bit wilder. Uh, and what it's really sort of evolved to be is a press that specialises in what I call literary objects. So an example of a few of them here. We have uh, miniature books to be read with magnifying glasses. We have poetry games to be played with dice. We have poetry tea bags. We have poetry in test tubes. We have completely blue books with no words in them. We have poetry written on fossils. We have poetry in takeaway boxes with chips made out of foam. We have tarot inspired poetry decks. We have postcards. We have conceptual sequences on card. We have conceptual sequences in books. Um, reversible flip chart poetry, and we have limited edition object poetry like this banner paper, uh, this um, paper globe here, and um, poetry printed on vellum, transparent vellum. So um, there, there are 60 of these in all, so if we will make it 60. So um, yeah, 10 years, 60 objects. So the latest two and the ones that we are here to talk about tonight or to hear from the um, writers and creators of tonight. One that's recently been launched, sorry back on waiting room duties for a moment, one that's recently been launched which is Turns by Philip Terry, uh, very much in the um, Zimzala tradition of objects. Um, this is um, what we call um, an, a selection of Ulipian interactive text objects in a box. So that, was, that came out in October and that's available now. So we'll hear from Phil first around that and some other things. And um, one that is coming soon is Sophie Herxheimer's Index, um, which is a series of prophetic poem cards. You'll hear more about that from Sophie herself. And at the moment we're in the middle of crowdfunding for that. So we're raising some money to have these things made. Um, we are using a, a small independent printer, so it's a bit more expensive than it would be for if we were using just a printer off the internet. Um, and we're in the middle of um, crowdfunding for that at the moment. I know quite a few of the people who are on here tonight have been have supported that, so thank you very much. And we've got two weeks of that left, and that gives you a chance to get the cards at a 40% discount and also access to some um, exclusive rewards, I think we're calling them Sophie, aren't we, that, were, that have been produced by Sophie. So I'm going to send around an email after we've um, finished here tonight, which should be around about an hour's time, 
and that'll have details of everything in, in there too, uh, including how to, more how to turns and more about index. But to start off with now, we're going to move on and begin by hearing from Phil. So I'll just introduce Phil. I'm just really going to show you a few of his books here. So his works include Ula Poems, uh, Shakespeare's Sonnets, which are Shakespeare's Sonnets rewritten using a wide array of techniques and methods and different sources and transformed. Dante's Inferno, which takes Dante's vision of hell and transplants that to the University of Essex. Advanced Immorality, which is a rewrite of Raymond Cano's Elementary Morality, which came out in a PDQ a little while back. Dictator, um, which rewrites Gilgamesh, the ancient Mesopotamian poem Gilgamesh, into Globish, a language developed for, that's a business speak language, I suppose you, you'd describe it as. There are books he's written, and as an editor, um, he is editor of the Penguin Book of Ulipo, which came out last year, um, and is, I believe, a Time Literary Supplement Book of the Year. So without any further um, from me, I'm going to hand over now to Phil and stop sharing. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah? Um, can, you hear, can everyone hear me? Just wave if you can hear me. That's, that's okay. Okay, these, um, so these little things, I'm very pleased Tom's done, are um, little, little object things. And they're, they're really there to sort of hold and leave the hanging around in your house and not spend too much time reading. You might just turn the pages occasionally and get onto a different page and sort of hold as an object. So they're not, it's not going to take you very long to read all three of these. You could probably read in about five minutes. So it's, um, I'm not quite sure how easy it is to read from. I'm going to read for about 15 minutes, uh, three different things. The first thing I'll start with is one of these, is one of these things, which I'll try and read, which is, um, is this one called this is this is the prototype it's, it looks it's the first version tom did had a year the words worth was in yellow i think tom must have been thinking of the daffodils that appear later in the same poem um so this is um a sort of book you can it's uh what is it Wordsworth. so it's kind of, it's obviously modeled on raymond Cuno's hundred thousand billion poems cent mille milliards de poem um, and like that book, you can flip, flip over the pages, which are cut into strips, as in the game Heads, Bodies, Legs, and then you get different combinations of text. This one gives you variations on I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud, hence the title uh, Words Worth. So I'm gonna, I've got a pile of books here. The three fattest books I could find in my office, including Marina Warner's fantastic Phantasmagoria, and biography of Keats by Andrew Motion and Aesop's Fables. And that's a very sturdy, um, that's the sturdiest foundation I've ever read on. So hopefully that'll work. And if I tip this screen, you might just be able to see, can you see this just slightly that I'm turning something? That'll give you an idea of how the book works, even if you can't read it. So here goes, this is really difficult to read this. Once I've read this, I've got the difficult bit over. This could go completely pear-shaped but because uh, it's all up to chance. But here goes, Wordsworth. I wandered lonely as a cloud. I wandered lonely as a cloud. I wandered lonely as a cloud. I wandered lonely as a clod. I wandered lonely as a cloud. I wandered lonely as a cloud. I wandered lonely as a clod. I wandered lonely as a crow. I wintered lonely as a crow. I wintered lonely as a clod. I wintered lonely as a cloud. I wintered lonely as a crow. I wintered lamely as a crow. I wintered leanly as a crow. I wintered silent as a crow. I wintered lamely as a crow. I laundered lamely as a crow. 
I laundered lamely as a crowd. I laundered lamely as a cad. I laundered silent as a cad. I faltered silent as a crowd. I faltered silent as a crowd. I faltered silent as a clot. I faltered silent as a cow. I faltered silent as a cop. I whimpered silent as a cop. I fumbled silent as a cop. I loitered silent as a cop. I loitered stony as a cop. I loitered phony as a cop. I loitered stony as a cop. I loitered stony as a cop. I wandered phony as a cod. I wandered phony as a cod. I wintered phony as a cod. I wintered phony as a cop. I wintered stony as a cop. I wintered stony as a cod. I wintered loudly as a crop. I wintered loudly as a cow. I fumbled loudly as a cow. I fumbled clumsy as a cow. I loitered clumsy as a cow. I pondered lonely as a cow. I pondered lamely as a cop. I pondered clumsy as a crop. I pondered clumsy as a cod. I pondered phony as a cod. I pandered phony as a cop. I pandered phony as a clot. I pandered phony as a cad. I pondered phony as a cod. That's enough of that. Um, <clears throat> so the next stuff is much easier to read because it's just like a normal book. So I'll remove that if you're still here. Fantastic. Um, so the next thing I'll read that, as I say, was um, uh, I mean, there are lots of books like that out in the world, many of them for, for children using pictures, combining traditionally heads, bodies and legs. But there are, there are lots of beautiful variations on that. In uh, particular among books for children, Kuno was inspired by the books for children, and that piece was Kuno's poems were inspired by the heads, bodies, legs thing, and that and that thing was obviously using the same thing as Kuno. So this, um, I'll read you a little bit from the Penguin Book of Ulipo, which Tom mentioned. This is from uh, Raymond Kuno. Uh, these are a few of his um, exercises in style. This book, Exercise in Style, was inspired by uh, Bach's Art of the Fugue, Art of the Fugue. And Kuno, it was Kuno's attempt to create in a literary form that sense of variation that is very frequent in music. And he does this by creating 99 variations on um, what he described as a sort of trivial, very slight story about an argument on a bus with somebody wearing a hat. He's put a ribbon He's replaced the ribbon on the hat with a cord, um, perhaps to, to sort of um, customise it and make it his own. And, and this chap has a long neck and there's an argument in the bus and that's kind of it. So I'll, I'll read you four of these, which are the four of Kuno's variations on that. First one, notations, is the basic story in note form. And then we'll have three of his more playful variations. So notations. In the S bus in the Russia, a bloke about 26 felt hat with a cord instead of a ribbon, neck too long as if someone had been tugging at it, people getting off. The bloke in question gets annoyed with one of the passengers standing next to him. He accuses him of bumping into him every time someone goes past, a whining tone which is meant to sound menacing. But when he sees a vacant seat, he grabs it. Two hours later, I come across him in the Cour de Rome in front of the Gare Saint-Lazare. He's with a friend who's saying, you should get another button put on your overcoat. 
He shows him where, at the lapels, and why. Olfactory. In that meridian S, besides the usual smells, those of priests, the deceased, eggs, jaywalkers, drunks, snorers, nutters, wings, hate-filled flatulence, unpopular songs, empty verses, French letters, and impetuous kebab eaters. There was a distinct odor of long juvenile neck, of the sweatiness of plated cord, a pungency of anger, a certain loose and constipated stench, smells that were so unmistakable in combination that when two hours later I passed in front of the Gare Saint-Lazare, I recognized them at once and traced them to the cosmetic, modish and tailored perfume which was given off by a single badly placed button. Thirdly, lipogram. So there's some letters missing in this. See if you can spot them. On an S bus, rush hour, a guy about 26, soft hat with a cord round it, scruff too long as if caught in a tug of war, a woman and child alight. Said guy angry with a man standing in front of him, arraigns him for bumping into him as folk push by, a whining intonation that sounds intimidating. Said guy grabs an opportunity to sit down without compunction. Two hours on, I cross his path again in front of a station. A companion who sports a similar hat is saying to him, you should put an additional button on your coat. His companion shows him at what spot towards the collar and why. And finally, uh, Kuno's antonymic translation of this. So he translates the story into its opposite. Midnight, it is raining. Buses pass by, almost empty. On the bonnet of an SUV by the Bastille, a hatless old man with his head buried in his shoulders, thanks a woman standing some distance away for caressing his hands. Then he props himself upright on the knees of a man who doesn't move from his place. Two hours earlier, behind the Gare de Lyon, this old man stopped up his ears so as not to listen to another man who denied himself the opportunity to say that he should have the bottom button on his shorts lowered by a hole. And finally, um, a little piece from um, This is from uh, one of those books Tom showed. I, I wasn't going to read this until we talked last night, actually, but um, this is a little piece from Dante's Inferno relocated to the University of Essex because I'm in my office at the University of Essex. So it would be nice to, to read that here. I've never read that from here before and probably won't do again. Um, when I wrote this piece, I sent it off to um, Harry Matthews at uh, Uli Po, who was, um, he was really nice about it, actually. He, he, and he, he even described it as a as a smasheroo, he, but he also he also said it had nothing to do with Ulipo. This wasn't a piece of Ulipo, according to Harry, which um, he said. So what? And and indeed, so what? Um, you can make up your own minds whether or not this is a piece of Ulipo. It's more a piece of um, um, bile, really. Um, Dante's Inferno, Canto One. This, this is the opening, and it features. Um, well, you'll see who it features. Halfway through a bad trip, I found myself in this stinking car park, underground, miles from Amarillo. Students in thongs stood there eating junk food from skips. Flagmen spewing ease, their breath of fetid myrrh and rat's bane, donners and condemned chicken shin, rose like distemper. Then I retched on rising ground, rabbits without ears, faces eaten away by myxomatosis, crawled towards a bleak lake to drink of leucotomy. The stink 
would revive a sparrow spread eagled on a lectern. It so horrified my heart, I shat Botox. Here by the toxic water lay a spotted trout, its glow lighting paths for the VC, and nigh the bins a giant rat, seediness oozing from her Flemish paws, pushed me backwards bit by bit into square five, <clears throat> where the wind gnaws <clears throat> and sunshine is spent. By the cash point, a bum asked for a light, hoarse from long silence, beaming. When I saw him gyrate, his teeth all wasted, natch, his eyes long dead through speed and booze, I cried out, take pity, whatever you are, man or ghost. Not man, though formerly a man, he says. I hail from Providence, Rhode Island, a Korean vet. Once I was a poet, I wrote of bean spasms, was anthologized in fuck you. You're never Berrigan, that spring where all the river of style freezes, I ask awe all over my facials. I'm an American primitive, he says. I make up each verse as it comes by putting things where they have to go. O oh, glory of every poet, have a light. May my zippo benefit me now and all my stripping of your sonnets. You see, this hairy she-rat that stalks me like a pimp gets her off my back for every vein and pulse throughout my frame she hath made quake. You must needs another way pursue, he says, winking while I shade my pin. If you would scape this beast, come, she lets none past her, save the VC. If she breathes on you, you're teaching nights. This way, freshman, come. If I'm not far wrong, we can find a bar and talk it over with Ed and Tom. Thank you. If you want to unmute and applaud, you can please feel free. How do we clap? <laughs> yeah. Cool. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, there's all sorts going on here. Hold on. Phil, are you still there? I'm here. All right, good. Um, I think actually we we could just if anyone's got anything they'd like to sort of comment to Phil or ask Phil, we could uh, we could we could do that now. Actually, you just unmute yourselves if you don't want to use the chat. Fine. If not, I've got a couple of things I'm going to ask him. Can I, can I, can, let me, I'll just, can Go I, ahead. I, I was, I'd be quite curious to see Phil use the turn wheel. Well, Phil hasn't got one there, but I have got one here, Marina, I can. Okay, sorry, I didn't realise that. So here we are. Mm. See that? Mm. See that, my camera? Yeah. So um, that says the word rain does not fall. We can turn it. And it now says the word cock does not crow. The word path does not wind. The word door does not open. The word fire does not burn. The word fish does not swim. The word rice does not grow. The word iron does not rust. And we're back to the word rain does not fall. So that's one of the three things you saw. Um, what I think is called a flip flap book. One of the, flip -flap. yeah. Um, and there's also a miniature book in there as well, which you read by turning, very difficult to do it um, live, but you read by turning and turning and turning till you get to the, to the very, the very end. So that all comes together in this box here. So that is collectively that is that is turns. So one of one of the, um, Marina, I'm glad you mentioned that. I mean, one of the one of the interesting things about that was um, um, it's about thirty years old. That one. It took me that long to find come across someone who would even think about publishing these things. And I'd known Tom for a long time before I realised he was doing objects and uh, and. 
and there we are. But um, I originally envisaged it more as a little sort of um, kind of just a little card, really, with your like a little card with your name on it. It was Tom's idea to make it, it now looks like a cog wheel. And Tom did a really nice online version of that, was where you can see it sort of swirling um, on the internet. And and that cog thing made me think, especially the way Tom had done it, that actually you could have a whole sequence of cogs. You could have loads of cogs with lots of different little aphorism things on. And you turn one cog, it would turn another, which would turn another. So it's so Tom's in a way, Tom's idea has released that potential in this to turn it into something much bigger, or you could have a nice big clunky machine with bits of wood and things, you'd turn one and it would turn the rest. So I'd, I'd kind of like to do that now. Yeah, well, discussions are ongoing, Phil, aren't they? We can do that. <laughs> um, Chris, did you have a question? Yeah, sorry, it, it, it may well be something that is uh, far too big for the scope of this evening, but I was just fascinated that you mentioned the thing that uh, Harry Matthews had said to you was, this is not really poor. And so my question would be, what what is it that makes something Ulipo or not Ulipo? And if you don't, if you want to pass on this, because it's too big, oh, well, a, uh, no, I mean, I could, subject, I'm yeah, we, happy. Could, we should we should meet sometime and talk about this. I could talk about this uh, for hours, but um, I mean, one one of Ulipo constraints is called a thing. I think they call the Canada Dry or something, it, and it means there's no constraint at all. Mm. It's just it looks like there might be. So, um, and if you take that on board, um, where does it begin and where does it end? And Ulipo also point out that almost all literature has some constraint of some kind, even if that's dividing a book into, into chapters at the other extreme. But I think uh, um, one of the, Harry invented a lot of translation techniques. Um, one of them he calls up to date. So he'd take, a, he'd take an early modern poem and translate it into sort of contemporary American slang and things like this and and uh, uh in a way that's and uh, he 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 calls that ulipo and what i was doing was taking dante and translating into modern language and a, and a modern place so you know maybe that's ulipo maybe it isn't but uh, as, as as harry said you know who cares at the end of the day it's the and he was he was always one who said you you know maybe use these structures to help you build something and then get rid of it like a bit of scaffolding and it's it doesn't really matter at the end of the day so you can make your own mind up do you think you're doing what they call expanded translation film i'm sure you've heard that term i think you're probably doing it before other people were um i mean do you regard yourself as translating say dante into I mean, you are translating of course in the sense and that you're changing it from one language to another but do you regard what you're doing as translation? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. It is translation. It's, I mean, one of the things, one of the things with Dante is, is um, it's full of contemporary references. And of course, over time, you lose those references. If you can, if you can use uh, references to people and places that people might have heard of today, in a way, you're, you're, tra you're translating, perhaps in a loose form, but it's, I think it's, I would see that book as translating. Some people do, some people don't. I mean, I was at, I was at the, the Expanded Translation Conference and Lawrence Venuti was there and was intrigued by everything that was going on. But at the end of the conference, he said, I've spent three days here and I haven't heard a single thing which I regard as a translation. So it depends how you define translation, obviously. Yes. Uh, anyone got uh, maybe one more? If anyone's got anything else they want to, to ask or, or mention before we move on to Sophie? Can I say something? I think your um, citing of Dante in an underground car park is masterful. And I think it's really hit today too. You know, when we're kind of all writing requiems for student life. Mm. I, mean, I think you've just hit the time. Yeah, well, I mean, it's not masterful. It's just where I happen to be. I'm, that underground park car park is about 20 metres from where I'm sitting. For the link. You saw the link. That's what poets do, isn't it? No, the link saw me. <laughs> the link saw you. Yeah, yeah but you grabbed it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we do have another couple of comments in the chat, Phil, which may, perhaps I'll send to you afterwards, just to say, um, well, I'll, tell you, I'll, read, I'll read them out now. So from Dan, we have um, Brilliant Hypnotic, A Dreamscape Fugue. Good. And uh, also some... 
uh, testimony from uh, Louisa Campbell, who agrees to your representation of the University of Essex. I'll send you full details of that later on. Um, oh yeah, and uh, Suzanne Pemberton asks, are you able to read the Dante at Essex, given that you have, I remember you reading it for us, uh, the, the Other Room reading series in Manchester uh, with James Davis and Scott Thurston, we're both on here. Uh, and you were reading, I think, quite, quite an early stage of that. And Robert Shepherd was there. Um, he was quite nervous about, about some of the things you're saying about vice chancellors, etc. So, does it? Are you? So, the question is: Are you able to read it at Essex? Uh, well, I, mean, I don't read through much these days, but it, it's um, uh, yeah, of all my things, I'm quite fond of that actually. Um, and I, yeah, I have read it at Essex, um, and. Uh, it was it was noted. I think it's one of the few volumes of poetry actually that our vice chancellor appears to have read. Um, but uh, <laughs> everything everything's um, well. Yeah, no, I can read it at Essex. I wouldn't. I would, probably don't go out of my way to. But it's it's all you know. Things are hidden in the thing. It, it has subtleties as well as very <laughs> unsubtlety things in it too. Mm. Okay. I'm, still here. I'm still here, Odessa. Yeah. Thank you very much, Phil. Um, great, really great, thank you. So we're gonna move on to Sophie in a moment. Before we do that, I'm just gonna very briefly show you um, another thing that's sort of happening with Zimzara at the moment. So this is Selected Scribbling and Scrawling of S.J. Fowler. I think quite a few of you uh, will, will know of S.J. Fowler or know his name anyway. This is a book of acemic writing. Um, we did the first edition of this back in 2018, um, and it is in the second edition now, 2020, tw twice as big, really. Lots of supportive essays, lots of new pieces in there. Um, here are some of them. Um, so we've got quite a lot of these all split up into sections with Steve contextualising about them and, and um, essays from people like Tim Gaze and David McClagan and people like that, and um, David Spittle, just... Um, setting the scene and, and talking about asymic, asymic, writing, asymic writing generally. And tonight, this is going to annoy, I know some of you here have already bought this book, so I have to settle, uh, I have to settle this, these differences with you uh, offline, as they say. Um, but just for, for the next 24 hours or so, just for people who've been on here, I'm going to do a, a, some money off that book, and you can get it from a third off. So uh, it's normally 11 99 in the UK, 14 99 elsewhere, so it'll be 8 and 10 um, and I will put some links to that in the chat in a moment if you want to do that. Um, that this, this link will be active for about 24 hours and I'll take it down back to normal price. And I'll also send that around in the email after we finished here tonight. Um, so um, that is SJ Fowler's scribbling and selected scribbling and scrolling of SJ Fowler. But we'll move on now to Sophie, our second reader of the night. So as I mentioned, Sophie's object, I can't demonstrate that because it doesn't exist quite yet. Um, it will be coming out in spring of 2021. We're at the moment, we're in the middle of um, raising some money um, towards producing that. Sophie will talk about that in more detail and po possibly also about some of the rewards that you can get that go with, go with pledging to support that. Just some brief, a brief intro to, to Sophie's work. Sophie's an artist and a poet. Uh, as you can see, her work is very, very visual and very hybrid blends those two disciplines together to um, incredible effect. Some of the, um, the books that she's produced are on the screen now, I hope will be on your screen. Um, Hurricane Butter, um, we've got Welcome to England, dramatic monologues in the voice of Sophie's German Jewish grandmother. Your candle accompanies the sun at the bottom right there, homage to Emily Dickinson. And um, The Practical Visionary, which is a collaboration with Chris McCabe. And also 60 Lovers to Make and Do, another um, TLS book of the year, I believe. So I'm going to stop sharing now and hand over to you, Sophie. Oh, I've unmuted myself. Oh, thanks so much. It's really lovely to see so many people. And I'm really, like Phil, delighted that Zimzala is around and in the form of Tom and in the form of the press to kind of pioneer this idea that poetry does not just have to appear in books and that we can have kind of exciting objects and experiments that can appear in more than one dimension maybe and so I was very thrilled that he wanted to produce Index 
and index is the culmination of a year of strange snipping where I've been snipping bits of old books which I've really thoroughly destroyed you know heartlessly destroyed and slightly revivified occasionally um, and I've been arranging them on index cards I got captivated by the pastel shades of the index cards firstly when I went to Germany and I was in a stationery shop and they were really small cute index cards actually we're not going to put those in the pack of cards because they're the wrong size but they're what set me off and also 60 lovers to make and do set me off a bit because I was making a lot of collages for that book and I'll read a little bit from 60 lovers as well as some of the index cards to you thanks so much to everybody who's supported the kickstarter so far we've raised more than we thought we would quite quickly and we'll print lots of packets of cards and the rewards are really weird but you can get a presentation sachet of choice phrases in a bag with a bow around it or you can get a DIY collage kit with many colours of bits of paper and beautiful phrases. And I will cut out animals of your choice in the colour of your choice. There's many tantalising items. It's win-win for me because it will help me get rid of some of my collage stuff. Anyway, um, I'll just show you some of the index cards and read from them. I'm going to do it very, very randomly because it is a pack of cards and so it needs shuffling. And I like actually the random generating of ideas and I love creating tools in which you don't know what you're going to get. And I like spontaneity generally, even at poetry readings, perhaps especially at poetry readings. So I'm going to just pick, cut the cards and read whatever it lands on. Okay. This one. Notes. Black stone, black gloves, opium, morphia, wine, rocks and shrines. Two voices, two tetrachords of the major scale, two owls, stern trees, numb shrubs, glass hills. The path stops where it stopped. A blue one. The dead man sat alone in the library mimicking the voices of celebrities. Excuse me, but somebody's dead, sang an unpretentious canary simply whistling what's true from her small handbag under this yellow brocaded soprano moon. Pink, peachy pink, a sensible girl witnessing the integration of the bride with the old lady into the sugar lavender sky was profoundly surprised later becoming a poet, a type that can linger like a beacon on a hill, absorbed in the colours of the diamond nothing. <laughs> Here's, and now I'm looking a bit more, which is really wrong, isn't it? But anyway, looking is cheating. But anyway, I could have arranged them in advance to pretend to be spontaneous, which is not the kind of thing I think of. No actual tabletop cooking is involved on the spirit floating table. A certain disembodied spirit, dining alone at a golden table, finds beauty in the dream veil and a quiver of pain, which she whips up into unique de decorations. I am, you know, dead, said the charming ghost. There is no table, only pale blue velvet clouds darkening on a plate. What's the idea this time? We are drawing some pictures. We are drawing three or four humble British shrubs dotted about with the words of the poet. If you make everything small enough, you will rise above all your difficulties for a few hours. In a world where ordinary household refrigerators sense their brittle presence, in the middle of a frozen city in Europe. Develop an emotional economy made up of tiny hot things, a painting, a shattered heart, the sound of a woman's bangles. That was a, another little unexpected twerk. Um, oh, 
this is a phone about London that I made before I went to America. I had a residency in California, which was amazing and very fortunate. And I really enjoyed cutting off American books because they have such different language in them. But this is from before I went and it's a London one. And it was really when I was getting a bit sick of seeing people having to live in tents on the street in Piccadilly and thought, what is going on? What is going on? Good luck, London. Quaint but decorative. Upside down in a glass jug of water. Remove the dried fur from the accepted standards. The rambling old problems. The death of trees. Deceit. The gasping man. The drooping mystic. Thorns. Poverty. Stiff-legged peasants in their ragged bone tents. God. Hardy upper-class ladies. Well, good luck to any society. And then this is an American, this is an American one because I found a really great book about fondue cookery. My favourite books to cut up are kind of cookbooks, instructional books, books of, um, books with advice in them. I find those really lend themselves to poetry and also books which have kind of horrendous dramas. Romances are good. And, and things that are sort of say despicable things and then you can rearrange them and laugh. This one, the problem of the day by day fondue hostess in a small town hidden by trees is the tyranny of monotony, diet chatter and disappointing cheese quality, as well as the matter of deadly violence, deep, deep inside her, her grim humour, like a hammer hitting large amounts of cheese. That may be enough of those for a second. Oh, I was quite excited about this. this is the last one I wrote before I came back to England. I didn't really want to come back to England to lockdown, but I was in lockdown in Berkeley and was quite spacious there and less densely populated than the corner of London I live in and most corners of London. I would like to thank Van Gogh for the tap on the nut. I have a need to arise out of this forest land. I'll be home soon carrying strong, dark green sympathy in my pockets. I have a few disconnected words, a quarter of a cup of chopped nuts, a pathetic obsession with California. I'm going to return to England through the trees, like a squirrel. Okay, and then I don't know how long I've got because I haven't been as organized as Phil with a watch. So Tom, if you want to make the neck throat cutting action. Um, Keep going. Keep going as befits the poetry compare who must be very good at the throat cutting action. So this is 60 Lovers to Make and Do and that has many things in common with the index collection of cards and it's you can do a bit of interactivity if you want and just shout me out, unmute yourself to shout out the profession of a person and I'll see if I've got a poem to match. Any offers? Accountant. Oh! Accountant, have I got an accountant? I may have to go for something else. Um, what's like an accountant? Librarian. Yes, I've got a librarian. <coughs> it's not like an accountant, but it is a good suggestion. Similar sort of. One oh more. Oh, sorry, my son keeps laughing. It's <laughs> take no notice. I've tried to silence it, but it won't work. Ninety-eight. Oh God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> He's, he's, he's like this, he's going to ring 5,000 times even though I've pressed um, do not disturb on my computer. Uh, I'll have to shout down to the others and tell them to. Librarian. She composed a lover from the dismantled workings of a record player and the middle hundred pages of a rarely borrowed novel. He was endearingly weak as he blinked into the sunlit wooden interior. All these years I've waited, he marvelled. And finally, I've witnessed it for myself. True love exists outside fiction. The librarian shrugged. Who said we're not fictional? She too was pretty excited, only she trained herself never to show it. And there's the color <laughs> of the people arising out of the woodwork, so to speak. Brilliant. Any other suggestions? Sophie, can you hear yes. me? Yeah. Do you, do you have a music teacher? I'm a piano teacher. Do you have a music teacher, piano teacher, musician? I'm sure I have, I've got a pop star and I've got a jazz singer. 
pop singer and a jazz musician. Should we do the pop singer? Yeah. Um, oh, I've got a bookkeeper after that, after all that, Marina. Oh. I think I owe you a bookkeeper in a second. We'll do the um, singer. Page 71. I always think a free silence thrown in is quite nice, isn't it? As, as silence is the main material of poetry. There we go. She blossomed a lover from headphones, sugar mice, and the pattern tights her cousin gave her for her birthday. He was basically quite a lazy moper. She ditched him at a festival, but was sorry when she heard he'd stopped breathing the next day. Turned out he really needed her. And the bookkeeper, I haven't read for a long time, I'd forgotten there was one, but that really is close to accountant, so you're getting that one. Um, page 129. <clears throat> she whittled a lover from a discarded tennis racket, a packet of salt and vinegar crisps, and a roadkill fox. <laughs> There is something rugged about him, smiled her friend Sue. He was refreshingly open and frank with her, yet guarded and jealous with Sue and Jeff. Why do you even bother with those idiots? He muttered. Um, thank, you. thank you, so, thank you, Sophie. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pleasure. Um, and thank you, Sophie, too, for the musician, the singer. That's no great. Um, I'll see if there's any other... You know, you're welcome. Anybody can call out one. Sophie, um, could we have um, a textile designer or something to do with textiles? Who said that? Say your name. It's Rosie. Oh, Rosie. Hooray. Hello. Hey. I love your voice. <laughs> okay, well, I've got a weaver. That would um, be great. Okay, that's page 122. I've got lots of textiles, of course, because it's my interest, one of them. <laughs> weaver. She clicked a lover from natural pigment dyed wool and some lonely days in the mountains. He smiled sideways, the cheeky goat. He made adventurousness routine. You aren't lonely anymore, are you? He grinned. As again, he tied her to the bed with her own yarn and set about her warp and weft as if he was born to such a task. A bit saucy, the weaver. Thank you. <laughs> um, you can have a really weird one like the anaesthetist. That's a nice one to end on. I'm sure that it's throat cutting time. And the anaesthetist kind of goes with that because we all need to be anaesthetised for that sort of thing. Have you got any lawyers or judges? Have I got what? Uh, lawyers or judges? I had to take those out. They were just too strict. Oh. <laughs> I might have, I've got a politician. Have you got an upholsterer? I can't remember if you I've have. got an upholsterer, yeah. Yeah. You want an upholsterer, do you? Go on. <laughs> okay. If you can. 94. I quite like this sort of, you know, pick and mix way of doing it. Yeah. Upholsterer. You can see the people trying to make themselves real out of the interior there. Perfect. Um, she crafted a lover from five yards of plum velvet, a book of ballads and a shovel of loose leaf tea. He had large lustrous eyes and a corpulence you see stuffed into tailoring only in period dramas. His mournful devotion ornamented her parlour, but briefly, as he declined to accompany her to her next more minimal phase. His tears were Victorian crystal. Fantastic. Anyway, I think that's probably enough of those. And maybe I'll just read, end with a couple more collage. Well, I can show you also some of the, the designs I've been making for the backs of the cards, the index cards. Um, I wanted them to work well either way up, as playing cards should. And so some of them have a kind of <coughs> still life that works either way up. Like they're like little counters. And then this one's probably got too many words on, but I couldn't resist making more little poems like that you can turn around. Um, Is that the, the size they're going to be, so? Are they... No, they're, they are actually going to be the right, the same size as I made. Right, oh, okay, it's which, index. Yeah, which is um, three inches by five inches, I believe, in old-fashioned imperial measurements. 
<laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, any any request? I don't know. Is that it, Tom? Have, have we got time for something? I was going to maybe. Yeah, carry on. Um, I've been making these also these little collages on munitions factories from an old um, architectural review from 1917, which which had has a lot of empty factory units on its pages on its adverts. You know, do you need to hire our munitions factory? Blimey. I thought it was quite a good, um, you know, recipe for a poem. Um, oh, darling, what world is there to receive a smoking pistol? The quick-witted saleswomen, the frightened consumer, sit down and have a quiet cigarette. Darling, big trucks loaded with poverty, either visible or invisible, run around the country all the time. Please look for me as I'm going to try to avoid being knocked down. And, and I'll read another index card poem because this is quite a nice one, I think. He laid his damp palm on the frozen face of nature. The sun was hidden like a long misunderstood woman. She raised her head and gave a little cough. At length, she asked him in a casual voice, do you know what a disaster is? Thank you, Sophie. That's okay. Um, <laughs> you get a lot of applause, you just can't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just before I open it out a bit, could you just... Um, with index, if you if you pledge, you, there are other ways to support us where you, you can get some sort of some rewards and some extra stuff. Just wonder if you could just briefly explain what they are, Sophie. Oh yeah, so if you if you spend twenty one pounds on the Kickstarter, you get a beautiful box of the index cards. And Tom's found really a great box supplier, and we're going to customize the boxes, and they're going to be beautiful. And that's yeah, normally they'd be thirty five pounds for a box, so that's a good trick. And then if you spent £35, which is normally just covers the cards, you also get sent a sachet of choice phrases. Now, I do believe I've got one lying around here because I made one. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, but where is it? My studio, I have tried to tidy it up, but it's not tidy. And so, like an idiot, I haven't got the sachet to show you. I can... You'll have to look on the Kickstarter, I'm afraid. Because and you won't be able to see it thrown in front of you in three dimensions by me now. And then the other thing that you would get if you spend a few more bob is you get a DIY collage kit in which I'm going to put lots of beautiful hand painted paper, scraps of old magazines and books, choice phrases, all kinds of delights so that you can make your own mini collages wherever you are and however long lockdown continues. And you could even make your own large collages because you can augment them with these dainty scraps. And then if you spend some vast fortune, like a hundred quid, you can get an original artwork. So you'd get one of the real cards really glued down and signed by me, and it would be very posh and cost more than a hundred pounds in the shops I'll be bound. And if you were really reckless and spent 200, you'd get two original artworks. And when you get the original artworks, you also get the collage kit and choice scraps and a pack of cards. Wow. Okay, thank you. It's like the shopping channel, this, isn't it? It's like what? It's like the shopping channel. It's the shopping channel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've felt I was a bit of a natural for the shopping channel, and now this is my lucky chance. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd buy some upholstery cleaner off you. No doubt. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> anyone got anything, that, any comments or questions to Sophie? Uh, I, I have I a would. question. So I don't know who was first there. Oh, oh I, have a, I have a question, Sophie, this is Maura. Hi, Maura. Hi, I, I, I loved you reading. I love the index cards and I have your lover's book that I'm just enjoying the poetry there. So I have a question on the index cards. When you cut them up, do you rand, you pick them? Do you think of the poem? I look the word? for the, they I, 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 take me absolutely ages and ages to write. Mm. And then quite often when I've written them, I don't really, um, I've glued them down and then I've gone off them. So I have to be oh. quite careful about gluing them down because, so I leave, I usually assemble things out, you know, I try, like any poem, I try to find a first line, a last line, some lines to go in the middle. 
I try to let the words lead the imagery and the imagery lead the words. It's a, it's a very instinctive and bizarre process, but I, I usually laid out a few of them on my table mm -hmm. like one day and then the next day get up and look at them and see if they were any good or not and then Very take good. them out of them so they're much you, they're, they're like an editing they're like an editing thing as much as they are a composing thing and great. so um I was having a moment where I couldn't really think of writing a poem using my own words so the words that sort of left me a bit I don't know why hmm. I do sometimes and so <laughs> I found using other people's words was quite a helpful um framework do you ever think just for fun just randomly just taking some of the words and putting them down not thinking about the poem and just seeing what it what it is just for fun most of my life is like that <laughs> <laughs> and then occasionally I will sort of put them in an order no seriously I'm serious about that I'm always doing things that make absolutely no sense at all and the back <laughs> I was showing you are kind of like that you know like this one where is it? I just had it a second ago. Um, one of them is just got, it's just raining phrases. They don't add up. They don't go together. Mm -hmm. And in some ways I find that annoying, you know, like it's less satisfying than making an actual project mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. having them create a different type of sense, you know? Right. Right. Thank you, Sophie. Pleasure. And can I ask something? It's Marina. I'm not putting on my camera. <laughs> it's late at night for me. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you how it, and Phil actually, both of you, how it affects your life. I mean, in the sense that this is a rather surrealist way of living, that you are gathering chance encounters, chance words, chance patternings from the day-to-day -day, uh, experience you know, as you go about things. Um, but does it, does it, does it make you actually does it kind of enliven your existence? Is it a good thing to do because it's kind of sharpening your reactions to the world? I think it just helps me cope with the world. I find the world keeps going along on these sort of quite repetitive linear trolleys and they feel a bit, you know, monotonous. So I quite like the idea to take little snippets and it's like rearranging the world starting with your own head and yeah I mean I've got I've got lots to say about <laughs> about it but I'm gonna let Phil speak <laughs> oh, <clears throat> I don't know I have much to say about this but it's, it's a nice question I, I mean I don't know finding finding anything finding anything new is kind of always interesting and, and enlivening and, and makes you I don't know kind of glad to be alive if that's not too much of a cliche but um, and so when we're with writing I'm always much more interested in the book I'm going to write after the next one than I am in the one I've just written just because like like Sophie was saying you you put things down and they've done and you forget about them I feel pretty much like that about books often though, though occasionally they come back and surprise you and you think yeah that, that there was something interesting there but uh I was saying to Tom and Sophie, actually, that because um, we met on Monday night to rehearse this, we didn't read the stuff, but we just chatted to each other and got an idea about what we were going to do. And uh, and I went home that evening. I was I was doing some reading and making some notes as as I always do. And you know, all of a sudden, just just because I'd been at this thing with other people, I suddenly things I've been trying to work out for ages just fell into place. And I said, "Oh, that's how I can do this thing." And it's something I've been thinking about for six months and I suddenly realized I get that for I, I was really reluctant to do online poetry readings I've done three in about a three weeks now and and actually they seem to work one of the things I really most miss in my life with lockdown is uh going to poetry readings and hearing other people read poetry and and seeing the just people I really like who I see at those things and and I kind of miss that and I got a little bit of that with Tom and Sophie the other night and it just energized me so often when I go to poetry readings and Go and see somebody I, I get a burst of energy on the train on the way back and it's a shame that we can't do that at the minute but hopefully hopefully it'll come around again thank you thank you both okay um, you, everyone. Hey, oh uh do you, have, do you have time from my oh yeah, yeah. question from america mm -hmm. uh 
everyone. Uh, I'm Dan. I'm, I'm calling in from Berkeley. My first question is, are, are Bob and Quid the same thing as I think about plunging my vast fortune into buying some books? Oh, no. Bob is a shilling. We don't have them I anymore. Okay. And Quid is a pound, which we have a few of occasionally. Great. Okay. <laughs> just to check. Uh, but, but my more serious question, if we, if we have time, um, is uh, just about uh, this idea of travel. Right, and, and what it means to travel and what it means to find new things, right? If we go on the assumption that um, the unexpected situation, the unexpected find is what often leads us on a creative journey. What do we do when we're not traveling now these days in the same way? How do we, how do we uh, see anew? How do we come upon different things if we are kind of ossified in terms of our schedules now? How do we, how do we get that burst of energy that, um, that Mr. Terry was talking about as artists? Well, reading, <laughs> it's one way, isn't it? I mean, reading and thinking and talking and listening. And um, certainly what Marina's question made me think about a little bit is how the air is full of lost conversations and remembered phrases and findings. And that even when you go in a mask to a shop, and buy things, you have a little chat with the person at the checkout or you hear other people, you know, looking for their biscuits or something. And that these words, which are so separate from the experiences inside your head and in your mood and, you know, I think there's all these collisions all the time, which are sharpening and a bit remind me of Marina's question and your question that the stimulation where you want to put things together that don't necessarily go that's just going on the whole time anyway, isn't it? Between streets and lampposts and people and dogs and cats and stuff. So it's kind of like a stimulating world whether you're widely in it or narrowly in it. You know, it's forensic times. We're up close to everything because of lockdown. So we have to get our inspiration from details. I don't know. <laughs> a thought. Oh, it's all gone very quiet. We're all oh, feeling good. sad because we can't be together. I know. Yeah, it is mm. sad. Okay. Um, yeah, well, I think, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Thank you to Phil. Thank you um, to Sophie. I'll be in touch this evening um, with a follow-up email. This, just so you've got some links to the things we've been talking about, to turns, which I can hold, to index, which I can't hold, but Sophie can hold. Oh. And um, yes, thank you very much, everybody. Um, and we will, um, yeah, I will be in touch. Thank you. <laughs>